All right, we're back today with uh, one of our favorite all-time guests, <laughs> Dr. Annie Neuror, Baltimore physician. Yeah, but we've decided Not she's just PT Annie. Okay, yeah. PT Annie. We're just Annie. going with that. Single name. <laughs> That's the nickname. All right. And Is that, you can put that on your business cards. Yeah, just Annie. Do you have business cards? Are those still a thing? Yeah, I okay. do. I do. I have those somewhere. All right. right now, can you give us one? No. <laughs> I was like, I'm going to have to go back to my office and find them okay. and then bring them back to you. So you're not actually using them. You just have them. I bring them to like races and stuff. Oh, do you? Slide them. Yeah. Uh, Slide them across the table. At the start, Ooh. you just throw them in the yeah. air like confetti. confetti. <laughs> One of those things that like shoots out t-shirts. Like- <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, t-shirt cannons, hot dog cannons, all the things. Okay. So believe it or not, we're going to actually talk about maybe uh, injury <laughs> prevention, injury uh, rehab, and a lot of other things today. I yeah. I think that's the goal anyways. Annie has been on the show before. So if you didn't listen to episode 226 of The Drop, go back and do that because we mm-hmm. got a little bit more in depth about Annie's personal life and sort of how you ended up in this career. Mm -hmm. But in case someone isn't going to go do that, can you just give us like a quick, hey, this is my background education and why I can talk about these things? Yeah, absolutely. So I'm a doctor of physical therapy. Um, I've been a practicing physical therapist for almost eight years now. Um, I've only practiced in Baltimore or I guess in Annapolis and then in Baltimore. Um, And I direct the Sinai Running Rehabilitation Program um, that's right up north of the city. So I've been there for seven and a half of my eight years, um, kind of building that program. Um, I also own a teaching company called Finish Line Seminars um, with Dr. Mary Miller, who's also a local physical therapist here um, at True Sports. So we collaborate. We uh, we have two courses that we put out, and it's for other physical therapists and PT students and PT assistants to take. So when therapists are kind of overwhelmed by trying to like figure out how to analyze running form and treat running conditions. They can take our course and learn more about like how to make it a little bit more digestible. Um, and I promised Mary I would plug it. So our next <laughs> course is May 4th and 5th at Sinai hospital. So nice. So yeah. I had Wait, to so that's sure for people. That, is that for like someone who's just interested, like a me who doesn't have a background or this is specifically for someone in the, in this, like in that. These courses are specifically for a physical therapist. They're like, you have to have continuing education. So every two years you have to renew your license and you have a certain amount of hours you have to uh, submit for continuing your license. So they're accredited for PTs, PTAs, and PT students. You're welcome to take one as someone else. It's just they're expensive for for that. But we do do some community courses too. Um, And we're actually starting to try to like, implement some more like community friendly courses, um, for, for people to come to and that aren't full day long courses. These are like, this is a two day course coming up. It would be more of like an hour or something. Got it. That. So yeah. So we'll be doing stuff like that. Cool. Not to inflate your ego or anything, (laughs) but I just was, while you were talking, I was not paying attention. No, Uh, I was looking at the stats from when you were on before and you are one of our top five most downloaded episodes. Oh my god! Ever. I Amen. didn't know that. Mm-hmm. Whoa! Only Maybe behind. I should just be one named. At least in the yeah. last. <laughs> at least in the last year and a half, only behind Kafuzi, Alex Hermanson, and Doctor Phil Maffetone, the oh controversial. Oh yeah, that oh the Phil heart Maffetone. rate guy, right? Yeah. yeah, yeah. We got so a anyway. lot of flack for that one. Oh really? Yeah, yeah. those are the best <laughs> ones, though. Yeah. I mean, did it, you they have are. Chris McDougal on? Uh, we did. Yeah. Oh, you beat out Emma Bates. You yeah, beat out Chris Schweitzer. Wow, yeah. Chris, like, I, maybe so, I'll write a book. <laughs> let's do it. There you go. All right. Believe in the Run Publishing House coming up. <laughs> <laughs> Established 2024. I mean, people do really big things after they come on the drop. Let's be honest. Uh, lots of PRs, yeah. Olympics. Yeah. Uh, oh, cool. okay. So yeah. I'm going to get faster. Is 100%. What you're okay. It's guaranteed. Uh-huh. Okay. Do you have any marathon? Do you have Nothing any races coming, coming up? up? Okay. I gotcha. Got I should. I'm going to sign up for something, though, now that you said I'll get faster. Do it. Yeah. All right. Let's get into Kevin, it. Yes. What do we want to start out with, Meg? You have a We have a list here. Yeah. So we didn't talk about some injuries that we wanted to talk about mm-hmm. last time mm-hmm. because Robbie kept talking about his problems. we just talked about Sorry. your wobbly, knobbly ankles yeah, the whole time. Yeah, selfishly. <laughs> um, so let's talk about my problems, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, which normally stem from my Achilles. Mm. 
So talk to us about all of the potential injuries around like the ankle, Achilles, mm-hmm. and that area. Okay. Okay, so Achilles is frustrating, obviously. Mm-hmm. So there's also like kind of a lot of misnomers around tendonitis versus tendinosis versus yeah. tendinopathy. Um, they're not all the same. They're not all the same. They are all very similar, but it's really based on how long you've been dealing with it for. Okay. So if you hear, think of itis, like I always tell people, it's like, you know, you say like, oh, I've got the itis. Like when your stomach hurts or something. I don't know yeah. if you've ever said Con- that. Conjunctivitis. I, yeah, I don't like, even know what that is. Oh, that's that's gross. Oh, that's your that, eyes. Yeah. Oh, is that think, pink eye? I think so. Yeah, that's, <laughs> yeah, that's the worst. <laughs> so not that kind of itis, okay. but an itis usually means it's actively inflamed. So it's a short time frame um, that something is actually usually actively inflamed. And that's when you think of things like ice potentially using anti-inflammatories. However, there's a lot of controversy of like, oh, do you really want to stunt an inflammatory yeah. response? I have it, questions about that. Yeah, and I had people reach out to me after the podcast, actually. My father included. <laughs> who sent me like a National <laughs> Geographic article about like, do you really want to stunt your inflammatory response? Um, I think it depends on like what type of time frame you're on for your training. Like if you get, okay. you know, a flare up of your Achilles tendonitis and you've got the Boston marathon on Monday, like I would say, take that naproxen and ice that sucker and go. Like, okay. I think you want to stunt your inflammatory process there because you need to be able to perform in the next week or so. If you're not in like some deep training cycle or, or something like that, I think you can actually kind of avoid icing it and, and, kind of let the inflammatory process go through its full like five to seven day cycle. Um, But I have not run into a lot of issues with people like just simply icing themselves. Like I don't think there's any real problem with applying ice to something that hurts. Like I think your body will still cycle through its inflammatory process. To so you ice. don't, you do want to allow the inflammation because it helps the healing process. Yes. It's basically inflammation is kind of like the kickstart of a healing process. Okay. Um, it's why you see, I don't know if you guys have ever been like, um, familiar with like platelet rich plasma injections, uh-huh. things like that. So what they do with that, which they do a lot for tendonitis or tendon tendinosis, honestly, is they draw your own blood, they centrifuge it and then they um, injected in, and that, that onset of one, the inflammation of just the injection plus like the new blood flow is basically meant to re kickstart the inflammatory process. Is that legal? Yeah. Oh yeah. Oh, it's legal. What's the, what's the thing you can't do? Didn't they say H- blood? H G H. Oh, letting, blood doping. Blood doping. Okay. Bloodletting. <laughs> I think that's like with leeches. Well, yeah, okay. yeah. That's civil war. Like, yeah, that's like marathon old. treatment. Yeah. yeah. So, so that one's fine too. Yeah, I think bloodletting is like a little riskier, maybe. But <laughs> play, uh, PRP injections are like fairly common nowadays. Um, they use it a lot for like hamstring tendinopathy. Okay. I know a lot of like baseball players and athletes use it to try to get get back quickly yeah to get back faster yeah um and then again it's because it's kick-starting that inflammatory process and with inflammation comes healing chemicals and uh, processes as well so that's why you, they want that what's the percentage of that actually working because i feel like it's very hit or miss when mm-hmm. i hear about people getting prp it is injections. it is and it's often not covered by insurance oh. i think that's one of the reasons why is because the evidence isn't consistent enough to support that Okay. Uh, it's going to be effective or helpful. I've seen the same thing in the clinical practice. Some people respond really well to it. And you also see a lot of variability with what you're allowed to do afterwards. So that would be dictated by the physician who performed the PRP injection. And I've seen physicians say, like, we're going to immobilize your knee for six weeks after we do this. Whoa. We don't really want you doing anything. And Whoa. then I've had other physicians be like, wait 24 hours and you can go back to what you're doing normally. So... I've seen both right. like really conservative after PRP and I've seen both very much like, eh, just do your own thing after you, you know, the next 20. So is hours. that something you do or no. Rel- okay? No, I don't do it. Um, usually it's a, a lot of times it's either a non-operative or an, or an orthopedic surgeon. Oh, does okay. them. Now, when you're talking about the icing versus inflammation and how, how it cycles now, are you still run when you're saying it's like a five to seven day cycle? Do you, are you still running through that? What's the, 
Yeah. Yeah. So if it's a if it's an acute tendonitis, meaning you've had it for less than seven days or so, it actually might serve you to take a few days off because you'll you won't continue to inflame the already inflammatory process. After you get out of kind of like a week and a half to two and two weeks of dealing with it, you're likely kind of becoming into less of the itis or actively inflamed state and becoming more of like chronic. The The problem and the thing that re- most people do is in that first week of feeling it, you either don't feel it during your run and you don't care enough that it hurts afterwards that you just keep doing your training um, or it's just, it's, you know, it's not intense enough to really stop you in a sense. And then you end up kind of prolonging that process into what's called tendinopathy. Tendinopathy means a chronic tendon and quote unquote inflammation, but it's not having all the same like inflammatory processes is actually just consistently kind of aggravated. A tendon, a tendinosis means that the tendon itself is actually thickening and that's when it's become very chronic. Yeah. That sounds bad. (laughs) (laughs) You guys chuckle. Yeah. It's a thickening agent. Thickening of it. Um, it can be, but I think we tend to like get nervous about like tendon thickening and things like that. And I think if you can strengthen a thick tendon, it'll usually be okay. So it can go back to normal. It can, you can, there are a couple different things you can do. That's why you see a lot of another thing you'll see with a tendinosis or a tendinopathy is a lot of the instrument assisted things. So if you guys ever see like scrapers, yeah. um, like the sidekick tool or things like that, what that stuff is used for is basically it's reintroducing this kind of inflammatory process. And then what you're doing is you're using this tool to inflame the tissues and then break up these tiny little adhesions that occur with something like a tendon, uh, tendinosis. So you get these little adhesions that start to stick between the collagen of your tendon and that's what makes it thicker. So you're kind of breaking that up and then you ideally would load the tendon in a way of like, not quite stretching it, but putting this force along uh, the length of it. So doing, for example, for Achilles tendinopathy, Mm -hmm. you would use the tool, you would inflame the tendon slightly, and you would break up those tiny micro adhesions in between the tendon. And then you would do something like heel raises so that you load that tendon in a linear fashion. And you actually can like help in a way kind of realign those fibers at a histological or like a cellular level. So you said... When you're in the tendonitis stage, that potentially a couple of days off would be beneficial. Mm-hmm. But I've also heard that like the tendon is one thing where you should continue to be active. Mm-hmm. So once you're out of that stage, which happens quite quickly, like seven days is not that much time. Yeah. It doesn't really serve you to take time off. So a lot of times by the time people see me, nobody ever sees me in the first seven days of something hurting. Right. Part of it is scheduling issues. And, and two, it's just like you don't know if you should see someone or not. Um, so what I usually tell people is like, hey, if you just felt this today, like take some take a few days off, rest it chill for a little bit. Just give give it like four to five days and see if try another run and in that amount of time. It's so hard though. Cause at that point you're like, eh, it's probably exactly. fine. Yeah. I'll that's, just keep running. <laughs> yeah. That's the problem. It's like, you're like, I don't, I can't even tell if it's really yeah. real. And so you're like, well, I don't know. And so then you keep going. Uh-huh. And then after kind of a two week time period, it's like, I've had people take six months off. And then the second they start running again, they're like, I had to feel it again. And I'm like, oh. well, that's cause like yours is be- had become chronic at that point. And tendons do like to be loaded. Like you do typically want to, in some ways run and lift through a tendinopathy. But if you can avoid doing that in the first couple days of feeling it, Mm -hmm. you might actually avoid that whole process altogether. I think you need to repeat that like 10 times. (laughs) And I guess that's the problem. Like you said, people were like, is this a real injury? Cause it's, I feel like a lot of times it's not like you can't run Mm -hmm. and say you're in the middle of marathon training or something. You don't want to lose out on, 20 miles in that week or something Mm -hmm. so what how do you even decide whether to take a break or not because a lot of times there is there are things just that go that do go away yeah like the next day or two days later yeah so it's hard to decide what that is yeah and I think for a lot of people one think of what like like I said if you have a race in the next 
week or so, then I would say take anti-inflammatory measures, whether that be Aleve and ice or whatever else, um, just to get yourself through the race and then plan to take some time off after that, just for like a kind of a total body reset after a big Mm -hmm. event. Um, if you're more so like, I just want to maintain my fitness. There's a lot of things that won't irritate a tendonitis depending on where it is. So for Achilles tendonitis, typically cycling doesn't really irritate it. Sometimes coming out of the saddle will swimming doesn't often irritate it. Um, rowing, things like that don't often irritate it. So it, it, you can kind of do something and in the moment say like, huh, if I feel this, maybe I'll stop again, just within that small, shorter frame of Mm -hmm. five to seven days. But if you're, if you're not feeling it during the activity and you're like, I feel pretty good afterwards, you could probably do that activity to keep your fitness. Running will almost always irritate an Achilles issue just because the majority of your push off comes from your soleus muscle and that inserts into your Achilles tendon. So that would be kind of the first thing you'd almost want to take away in that brief time period and focus on something else that's less um, plyometric in a way. Yeah, that makes sense. You mentioned a leave. Mm Mm-hmm. Is that the one that's okay that you can take before <laughs> yeah. you run? I was like thinking Advil the same thing. is not like I've heard people be like, I can't believe you take Advil and then go do a long run or a workout, which like, okay, I don't do it a lot, but every <laughs> once in a while. And they basically said I'm like, that's like the worst thing you can do. I I am not actually like really supposed to give advice as to what okay. you should take. Only because I'm not like a medical doctor right. or like Got a it. licensed physician. You're not a learned doctor. I don't doctor. do, yeah, I don't, I'm a learned doctor. <laughs> uh, I don't do pharmacology or things like that. So from personal experience, yeah. I've taken, I usually take a leave because naproxen is kind of the NSAID that works best for me. Okay. Um, But I, I don't really know like the other, like. Is, it, is the leave people. ibuprofen? I, it's like an NSAID. Yeah, which is the it's same as steroidal. Yeah, is that what ibuprofen is? What's ibuprofen? That's the same. Oh, really. Okay. Yeah. The diff. Right. It's not. Um, what's Tylenol? That is. Oh yeah, that's. Um, a, well, really there's Google acetaminophen. Right acetaminophen. That's yeah. Yeah. That, yeah. That's. I don't think you're supposed to. I take think that. that's. Yeah. Say. I think I have heard the controversy with taking acetaminophen. Well, because that affects your liver. Yeah. So if you're Working running, hard. obviously you're taxing your liver. Yeah. Additionally. Yeah. So it says uh, ibuprofen is short acting and better suited for treatment of acute pain, whereas a leave is long acting and is used for the treatment of chronic conditions. That's from drugs.com. <laughs> that sounds reliable. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But I, I don't think, know if I would agree with that. But again, I am not in pharmacology. So but I they are keep both. My opinions they myself. are both NSAIDs. Okay. Okay. So. The okay. tendonitis, tendon up is just a, those terminologies is just the duration, <laughs> <laughs> the duration that you've had pain. Pretty much, yeah. And what's going on at almost like a, a cellular level at, at the tissue that's involved. Because okay. like I said, an itis can be anywhere, anywhere, conjunctive itis, uh, you know, appendicitis, anything like that. So it's really just staging at what point of inflammation you are at. And in, an, in, a, in a musculoskeletal environment, there's the early phase, which is the itis that you don't want to push through, but typically people do anyways. And then there's the apathy where it becomes chronic and you're actually kind of poking this bear and then backing off and then poking it again and backing off, knowing that it's, it's going to take a little while to get better, but you could probably tolerate a well-progressed and graded progression program. And then once you, once, if you're in a tendon, a tendinopathy, no, tendinosis that's where there's actual thickening of the tendon again it's it's not like a death sentence for your tendon or anything like that it's just the natural progression of what how the tendon responds yeah yeah i mean these days it's kind of a compliment to be thick so (laughs) some people might even take that as a good thing but i don't think i don't think it is um but yeah i would thought that was surprising when i had a tendinopathy and you helped me with that I thought I would come in and you'd be like, don't like, don't run Mm -hmm. for the entire time we're doing PT. But you were like pretty much run normal, Mm -hmm. Um, which I didn't understand and thought maybe you were not (laughs) psychopath. Yeah, like maybe (laughs) like questioning your education. But 
but you were right. <laughs> yeah, and it all like there it, it a lot of it depends on like which tendons we're talking about. Yeah, because um, mm-hmm. those tendons are responsible for different things. But generally speaking, tendons you hear this in P, the PT world all the time. Like tendons love loading, and loading is typically something that is um, linear and is heavy. We talked about bones last time and how bones love diversity. Mm-hmm. Like they like to be pushed and pulled and they like changes of direction and changes of forces. Tendons are more straightforward. Like literally they like to be loaded in a straight pattern um, and they like to be heavily loaded. So the problem with, with what you ran into is that you were running and it wasn't really getting better. And even if you were to rest, it wouldn't have really gotten better. It would have just come back because the tensile tissue and the tensile components of your tendons weren't thick enough or strong enough. And that's why I was like, so, um, like you need to do these hamstring strengthening exercises (laughs) because the running will not do it for you. Like you're, she just called you weak. Uh, oh yeah, (laughs) for sure. That's all I was like, you have to do these things and you can keep running, but if you're going to keep running, like this is the, this is what has to happen in addition to that. Yeah. Yeah, that's the cruel irony of running is that you do so much work and yet it does nothing to strengthen <laughs> <laughs> the things that it's you It's exhausting, wish it would. but it's like not making me <laughs> stronger. Yeah. Right. Anyways. Other than Achilles, what's the other, like in running specifically, is there another tendonitis that you see a lot? We see a lot of hamstring tendonitis or tendinopathy um, if, it's, if it's progressed. Um, and those typically come. Those can kind of be one of those things where like you did a hard track workout and you actually felt it kind of go because a lot of times hamstring irritations happen with slowing down uh, or decelerations. You'll see it too, like in track, a lot of times in the shorter distance, you actually see someone pull or tear a hamstring. Um, So you can have this kind of micro tear happen and Mm -hmm. then it'll become a tendinopathy Um, or you can just have it as a general overuse. And that's a lot of times it's like up in the, under butt area yeah um like your sit bone kind of okay. yeah the first time i felt it and i don't know which option it was but i was on a long run and my one friend made a john ober made a segment <laughs> near the horseshoe casino that was like uh a guy fury welcome to flavor town <laughs> strava segment i mean i get why you went for that yeah. yeah and i was trying to go for it it was like mile 14 of a long run i just mm-hmm sprint as fast as I could and the worst part is that I had paused my watch before that and didn't start it (laughs) so amateur yeah dude it was all bad and then after that long run it was or like right after that was when I felt it yeah and from then on it was two years of yeah it can be a long I've seen people like go like I think you said you were recommended for surgery I've seen people oh yeah there's somebody who an ortho because I went to like an orthopedic person or something yeah and then, yeah, he recommended for surgery. And I'm like, maybe I should talk to Annie before yeah. <laughs> I do that thing. <laughs> Thankfully, I did. Yeah. yeah. But yeah, the hamstring tendon is a big one, too. Okay. Um, patellar tendinopathy is is pretty common, like front is of the knee. Is that runner's knee? That is not. So that's oh. patellofemoral pain. So patellar tendinopathy, you will see sometimes, um, you'll see patellofemoral pain more. Patellar tendinopathy is really common in jumping sports. So if you're someone who not just runs but plays volleyball or basketball, mm-hmm. you might get a combined overuse basically of the patellar tendon. Or if you're someone who's really bouncy when you run, so you run um, like you're really up and down movements. I don't know if you guys have ever watched someone mm-hmm. run and they uh-huh. look like they're like bounding more than like running forward. Um, you'll Those types of running patterns will run into patellar tendinopathy more than somebody else. Um, so the traditional runner's knee, mm-hmm. I I felt like I was kind of getting that mm-hmm. when I was um, training a few weeks ago. And I had a friend send me PT videos from two different people. And mm-hmm. they had two different theories of what was going to fix it. And one was like strengthening the actual like tendons right around the knee. And then one was strengthening the hips. Mm-hmm. So what's what do you say? Yeah, so that's a great point. There's these two kind of, I don't know if I'd say they're conflicting ideas, but two different theories as to why you get patellofemoral pain. And it's either that your the inside of your quad muscle, your vastus medialis yeah. oblique, it's called, is not like quote unquote firing. And therefore what that muscle does is it keeps your kneecap inwards. And what happens if it's not firing quote unquote lay direct or uh, efficiently, 
your kneecap gets pulled out to the outside and that's why you get like kneecap pain. So okay. it like causes a maltracking of the kneecap. The other theory behind it is that because if your your femur turns inwards on your tibia, then that type of compression of the patellofemoral joint is what's actually causing it. And that turning in of the femur is a result of glute weakness. The newest, the the more recent research is more of a glute strategy. Again, that's why you see so much like glute focused PT mm-hmm. stuff. Um, the older research is probably more focused towards the VMO activation. The problem with the the VMO is that it's it's very hard to isolate just one part of your quad muscle. Like your quad muscle is made up of a group of muscles, and to say like, oh, well, I just want this one to turn on is impossible to do, with the exception of using really specific things. So. In clinic, we can do it because we actually stick needles in your VMO oh. and we stim them and then and we tape your knee so that we pull your kneecap inwards and then stim the muscle that does does that for you. And then you can actually like specifically isolate that muscle. But in every day trying to do like a squat so that only your VMO fires is impossible. Mm-hmm. It's a lot easier to make your hip stronger. And typically if you do that, if you get that hip strength component of it, it will, it will help. So it's, it's an easier way to kind of the same solution. Interesting. So the VM, VMO, Mm -hmm. Uh the, those exercises that they sent were like walking backwards. Okay. And then there was one where it was like, use a big like band Mm -hmm. and pull your knee essentially backwards. But Mm -hmm. you're saying that's never going to really just. Yeah. And I don't know, I don't know if that's exactly what they're saying that exercise is doing, but it, it is really impossible to isolate that part of your muscle sure. without stimming it and taping it that way. And most people don't have access to like neuromuscular stimulation. It's like the <laughs> zapper thing that you put on your muscle. Yeah. That's pretty cool. So you, sh- you shorten the word stimulation to stim. Is that, stim, yeah. that's the cool thing to say for yeah, people. Yeah. Like that. That's the in yeah. way to cool say lingo. Yeah. yeah. Stimming. stimming. I, I didn't know what you were talking about at first. And I was like, Oh yeah. I was thinking like separating the muscle from other ones, but so do you use that with um, like dry needling and stuff mm-hmm. or? Okay. Yeah, we will. We okay. will. Um, you'll see a lot of people right after like uh, ACL reconstructions, you'll see a lot of people get stimulation and, the, and you'll notice like there's always a pad on the inside quad muscle and that's because they're trying to get that VMO to fire. Okay. The, the mm-hmm. reason patellofemoral pain is, is so common is one mechanical And a lot of that is hip weakness. And then the other part is structural. So when you think of kind of the glute theory of of developing the pain, that's mechanical. It means that, well, some the glutes aren't doing their job, so the femur is turning in and it's causing this mechanical problem that's compressing the kneecap. But there's also a structural argument, and that's the VMO argument. And that's basically saying that this medial structure, the structure on the inside of the knee is too weak to counter the tightness of the structures on the outside of the knee. And anatomically speaking, that's correct. You have your IT band on the outside of your knee, you have your lateral retinaculum, which is a really dense connective tissue around the kneecap. So the VMO is set up kind of to fail because it's fighting a stronger version of a quad muscle, the vastus lateralis, the IT band, and the lateral retinaculum. So you got these three big hitters on the outside of your knee and only this one little guy trying to oh, do man. its best. Yeah. He sucks. So <laughs> yeah, it's tough. That, so that's like kind of the anatomical argument, okay. but there's also the mechanical argument of like, Hey, if you could just get your glutes stronger and you can make sure your femurs femur is in its position, mm-hmm. you, you can avoid having this flare up of pain despite the anatomical problems. Okay. And is this typically just overuse injury, Mm -hmm. the runner's knee? Yeah. So if someone is feeling that type of pain, what's like the first step to try and. That is something I say, go to PT. Okay. Like go to PT because one, we have ways to make the VMO fire that you don't have access to. Um, it, it could go away with rest. Um, usually better than a tendonitis does or a tendinopathy does. Um, but patellofemoral pain is one of the most common things that PTs treat, not even running specialists, but PTs treat in general. And it usually responds really well to physical therapy. Even if you just went and learned how to tape your knee effectively and learned some hip strengthening exercises and said, hey, if I just get my, if I just get on a, a decent hip program, then I think I'd be fine. But 
there's because it's a combination of kind of an anatomical predisposition of it happening plus a mechanical uh, factor, it's best to like do PT for that. Okay. Whereas other things, I would say like tendinopathies, maybe it would be nice to have dry needling here and there, but for the most part, you can get on a tendon loading protocol and follow that on your own and it should help. It might take some time, yeah. but it should, it would, it would, you could probably do it on your own more than patellofemoral pain. And w- between tendinopathies and patellofemoral pain, which one takes, which one is longer? Cause I feel like tendinopathy maybe, and when you're talking about doing it on your own, your own program, I think some people might give up too early because yeah. it might take longer than mm-hmm. they think. And you're like, oh, it's three weeks in. I'm still not feeling anything. Yeah. And then they just like give up on it. Yeah. I would say tendinopathies are the most, the most frustrating thing to rehab in mm-hmm. terms of time frame. So I would say that's usually much longer than okay. patellofemoral pain. Okay. Gotcha. And let's talk about, can we talk about plantar fasciitis yeah. too? I've never dealt with this. It's still a mystery to me. Knock on wood right now. Oh, have you? Oh, you you did. Yeah, that's right. I forgot you had it bad at one time. I had it. Or maybe do you have it all the time? No, I don't have it. But you just said you never had it. So I said knock on wood. Oh. Like that's how how it happens. This is real wood, right? (laughs) Yeah. Okay. There you go. Uh, Yes. I don't even know really what it is. I feel like no one knows. It's it's a mystery. Yeah. Yeah. So you can think of. So you, so it's the same concept of an itis. So you can have plantar fasciitis or you can have plantar fasciopathy. Um, it's most commonly known as plantar fasciopathy now because most people have it chronically. Like you, you don't hear anyone complain about plantar fasciitis or apathy until they've had it for two weeks. So you're out of the inflammatory sure. process anyways. Oh. Um, and people have that sometimes for years. Like it can be anywhere from four months to two years that people will battle it. Um, the plantar fascia is like a, a, a fan of dense connective tissue. It's similar in structure quality to a tendon. That's why it's treated very commonly like a tendinopathy or to like the IT band. Like we talked about last time, it's denser. It's not muscular. It's not highly vascularized, meaning it doesn't get a lot of blood flow. And that's what makes it something that's annoying is this to in, deal with. This is in the foot? It's in the foot. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. It's like the it, heel, right? Yeah. So it starts. Oh, it starts I it was at your in the heel. Arch. Okay. It it covers your arch. Oh. So you almost think of it as like a fan that starts in your heel and then fans out and goes to the basis of your toes, pretty much. So is it? Does it mimic your what metatarsal, like the bones in your feet, or what it, is it? It basically um, supports them in a sense. Okay. It lies underneath them. Okay. Yeah. And it's one big muscle? Or it's it's like not con- a muscle. It's connective tissue. Oh. It's like one big fan of connective tissue. And so what what is the deal with it? Like what's what's happening? <laughs> what's happening what's when it deal? when it gets what's problem? Yeah, <laughs> for, Why does it get so mad? <laughs> yeah, for, really though. What is that? Why does it get so mad or uh, inflamed or whatever? Yeah. So it. it a lot of times it w- it can have a couple different reasons. So one, if you're on your feet a lot, uh, it's a structure that just takes a ton of load over and over. If you're a heavier individual, um, we'll see people have plantar fasciitis just because of weight issues. Mm-hmm. It's not really like an overloading problem like it would be with a runner, but it's more of like just a weight issue that, that causes it. So you see it a lot in, in people who are overweight or who are in occupations that are on their feet all day long. My sister is a chef or a baker and she has, she's oh, about really? to it cause she's just standing oh, for like 10 hours at a time. And shoes can't help that. Shoes can. Okay. Yeah. Shoes can. Shoes can be helpful. Um, or you're someone who just loads it a lot, which is kind of where runners fall into. Um, again, the big problem is it's not vascularized, vascularized like muscles are. So when you think of like healing properties, they come through blood. And when a structure doesn't get a lot of blood, if it gets overused, it doesn't get a lot of the same healing things that come with, like, if you were to think of a muscular strain, you don't typically think of those lasting that long. Whereas when you think of a tendinopathy or plantar fasciitis, those don't get that blood, so they last much longer, and that's why it's so frustrating and easy to aggravate. Oh, okay. Um, 
I even I forgot your original question. Well, like, what is the deal? Yeah, <laughs> that's and, part and, of the deal. And are there so, certain people who are more uh, predisposed? Pre, wait, why am I predisposed? Messing up? Predisposed. I was <laughs> like, predispossessed. <laughs> um, predisposed to uh, to this type of injury because I and I don't know. I was just thinking about this actually yesterday, but I think I was talking to somebody who's dealing with plantar fasciitis right now, but. When I grew up, I, in the summertime, I literally never wore shoes, mm-hmm. like, out, unless I was going to the store, of course, no, mm-hmm. sh- no shoes, no shirt, no service, mm-hmm. but <laughs> I, I was, I was, uh, yeah, just all the time, like, never wore shoes, had callous feet, could mm-hmm. walk over anything, and I don't know, do you think that helps yes. long term yeah. for, you know, building up muscle, yeah. foot like muscle? Yeah, like, if you okay. can have... Cause I've never had any issues with my feet. Yeah. If you can have like your kids walk around barefoot, like safely, it's ideal because that's like the fundamental time of when you're building up mm-hmm. the arch support. And eventually when you're someone who deals with plantar fasciitis or plantar fasciopathy, I feel like I have to say both. Cause any PTs that listen to this will be like, well, it's actually, you know, <laughs> that's what you should call it. And I was like, okay. Um, it, it's, it, it serves you once it's not so symptomatic to be someone who kind of walks around barefoot. It's just that when you are symptomatic, ah. that will just keep it hurting. Okay. So you almost want to like build that strength up before you, I actually put people on like barefoot walking programs. Oh. So like, okay, I want you to walk around your house barefoot for five minutes tomorrow. And then my next week, I want you to do that three sets of five minutes throughout the day. Um, things like that. So you do eventually kind of want to walk around barefoot if you can do it. Younger, you typically build those intrinsic foot muscles well, and you also build um, kind of like inherent good joint mobility and joint health, like particularly at your ankle joint. Gotcha. We talked a lot about last time. If you're someone who does a little bit more barefoot stuff, mm. that's why you see people barefoot lift and things like that. What role does the arch play, if it does at all, in plantar fasciitis? Because like I have flat feet. Mm-hmm. I know Thomas has like crazy arches. Mm-hmm. Um, I think he's had planner a couple of times. Mm-hmm. I've maybe had it like once, but never. Does that matter? Yeah. And it's funny because if you are flat footed, you're at an increased rate. And if you're at, so Pez planus means you're flat footed. Okay. Pez cavus. And you can think your arch looks like a cave. It means you're, um, high arched. And we actually see increased incidences of plantar fasciitis in both those populations. Oh. And then if you're a neutral, it's like oh, you've got like kind of the best of both worlds. You're like in this in between. Yeah. yeah, yeah. You're like, <laughs> great. Um, the reason that is is because someone who is flat footed or maybe has more mobility in their foot, they go through more micro movements than someone whose arch is stiffer. So you're having to use more strength, particularly eccentric strength, to control that additional movement. And that will cause plantar fasciopathy or plantar fasciitis. Um, If you're someone who has a stiffer foot type or a higher arch that doesn't move, then you're someone who that that mobility just isn't really there. And so you're asking for more point areas to be taking more load. So it's not like your muscles are doing more. It's that certain specific parts of your fascia are getting loaded more because there's just not as much mobility to disperse that shock attenuation across the whole foot. Mm. Um, if you're someone who has a high arch and collapses, that's probably the, the worst case scenario because not only are you going through much more movement uh, and having to use additional muscle forces to control that movement, you might even also have that kind of dispersed or not dispersed as well as it should. So that's kind of one area you don't want to be is someone who's really high arched statically meaning when you're standing there but then when you start running that arch collapses right away or over a longer stride right and so if somebody has plan how do you even know if you have that so the key signs of it are pain in the morning when you wake up um it's usually like you get out of bed and you take your first steps and you're like holy crap my heel hurts and it can feel kind of sharp and kind of pinpointed. Uh Um, and then after you've walked like around a little bit, you're like, well, actually I'd be fine. I can go on my run. And that's part of the problem that people (laughs) run into is like, it gets better. It's also has that kind of tendon type characteristic of it'll warm up. And then once you say you go on a long run and you're like, you felt it the first couple steps and then you're like, that actually got kind of better. Mm -hmm. And then you go and sit after for a long period of time and then try to get up. 
then you'll feel it again. So it's kind of oh, this. So, so in a run, it might not hurt? Yeah, in a run, it might not hurt. Oh, really? It's usually the next morning when you wake up or if you were to go on a run and then sit for a while and then try to get up again, you'll feel it again. Cool. And it's hard to walk on? Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's usually weight-bearing pain. So barefoot usually hurts more. Um, after walking or after running a long period of times is when you'll feel it more. Sometimes during, too. Um, mm-hmm. That's why it's a little bit different than a tendon issue. Um, and usually it is at kind of like the base of your heel that most people feel it. You very rarely feel like plantar fasciitis, like at the base of your toes, even though it does extend that far. Oh, wow. Yeah. Yeah. And I know people that have had it for like a really long time, mm-hmm. like you were saying, which tends to be the case, I think. Mm-hmm. And it just sounds so frustrating because it sounds like even if you take off like months, mm-hmm. it can still just be there. So yeah. what what does someone do? So a lot of times if it's hard to explain this without like having a picture, but the thing we that the throw a picture on the YouTube version, <laughs> <laughs> if you look at a foot here, um, your toe needs to be able to basically extend. And that's what happens when you push off of the ground, mm-hmm. your toe should extend. You need about 50 degrees of toe extension. And a lot of people don't have that. Mm-hmm. So what'll happen is they tension their plantar fascia mm-hmm. It's what's called the windless mechanism of your foot. So your plantar fascia attaches to your big toe. Your big toe um, needs to extend when you push off, and your ankle needs to bend as well. So you have these two points of movement that need to happen at your ankle and then at your big toe. Your plantar fascia gets tensioned when those movements happen simultaneously, and that's what um, most people, if they don't improve their ankle mobility or their great toe mobility, they'll keep running into the same problem because it's like a mechanical problem that like they just keep pressuring the same plantar fascia because the joint above and below the plantar fascia isn't mobile enough. So that's like a stiffer tissue type. But the other type of plantar fasciitis can come from a weak foot. So if you're having too much mobility, too much pronation or the arch diving in, it's because you're not effectively strengthening muscles like your posterior tibialis, your foot intrinsics, and your gastroc and soleus, those are all your push-off muscles and the muscles that control your arch position. So you can run into two different things. And a lot of times people will be like, well, I've been rolling my foot out on a tennis ball for mm. two years and it's mm-hmm. not doing anything. It's like, well, that isn't addressing either of those problems. <laughs> <laughs> so it's like, it, it won't fix your mobility or your strength. Yeah. You're just literally pushing on an object in your foot that hurts and you're not doing anything that's actually going to make it better. Yeah, I've seen a lot of, Toe and foot strengthening exercises. I've never done them in my life, but how about you? Yeah, no, I've never done any uh, foot things. Yeah. But, but the key, uh, I, uh, one of the I, most prophylactic things is like walk around barefoot. If you're yeah. not symptomatic, like if you can walk around barefoot now and tolerate it, people should because yeah. it builds that foot core muscles uh, without you having to sit there and do annoying exercises. Yeah, for sure. I just imagine someone like extracting that clip. I've never 100%. done it. I've never done any foot things uh, yet. Yeah. Yeah. I got time. <laughs> Waiting for that. <laughs> uh, Wait, before we move off of feet, what, yeah, about, yeah. what about bunions? Oh, bunions. Okay. Oh, yeah. yeah. That's like a, and that's not funions, right? Because that's a gas station <laughs> snack that, that seems to be Spit popular. All over your uh, not funions. <laughs> right. um, no, they're not fun at all. No, no they're not fun. <laughs> fun. Bunions are typically very genetic. Um, so, you have to first think like, well, did your mom have bunions? Or she did. Have... There you it's go. Her yeah. Fault. yeah, it's actually my so grandmother's like, yeah, fault. Yeah, so blame Granny. Well, it goes the whole way back. Yeah. It's a generational curse. Grandmas yeah. were Man. real bad too. Yeah, and I feel like mine's just a matter of time before <laughs> my feet get that jacked up too. So the yeah the the biggest thing about bunions is that it's it's typically very genetic. Um, now with that being said, there actually are a, a bunion. The the scientific term is term is called like a hallux valgus. Yeah. Um, and it just means that your big toe is kind of drifting inwards of your foot. And then the bone that sticks out ends up getting rubbed on. And then that bone continues to grow because bones respond to rubbing and things like that. They end up building thicker bone. Um, so there's actually taping techniques you can do that align your toe a little bit better um, so that you're not getting that rubbing on the inside. Shoe wear can become important because if you wear a narrow shoe, it just rubs on the same spot over and over. So doing something like you guys know more wide toe boxes than me, but mm-hmm. like ultras are usually what I recommend for people who have bunions or, or things like in the metatarsals. 
Um, Meg got to switch over to Osha's. <laughs> <laughs> you can do whatever you want uh, yeah. for that. Um, and then the other thing is that pronation, that foot collapse. So a lot of times if your foot is flatter or if it pronates more, that will actually push because the arch is collapsing, that will push the toe towards the midline of the foot. And so there is a, a mechanical factor to it too. Most of it is genetic. Mm-hmm. Uh, some of it is structural and then part of it is mechanical. If it doesn't bother me, don't like if there's it. nothing other than they just don't look very cute. Yeah. But. I there's there's not really, in my opinion, you'll see like I don't know if you guys have ever seen the, like the the billboard on eighty three that's yes. like, Do you have bunions? Uh-huh. Come come Tom's have surgery always pointing for free. out being like you should go get surgery. I'm like, I don't need surgery. Yeah, I like I tell people like if it doesn't bother you, like you could all you could get surgery later down the line if it seemed like it really like messed up the yeah. your ability to fit in shoes or things like that. But there's no guarantee it's gonna get that bad. Is that similar to Haglund's? Is that the same concept or is that? Uh, it's the same concept kind of because Haglund's deformities, those happen on the heel at the yeah. base of the Achilles. And again, a lot of that has to do with like friction and right. tensile forces just being kind of consistent. Um, and so your bone will build okay. according to that. So it is, that's what I meant. Yeah. yeah. And is, But that seems to be more of a debilitating issue. It seems. For runners? It depends on who you ask. I've okay. seen people have huge Haglund's deformities and it doesn't bother them at all. I've oh, had okay. people have surgery to get them removed because it does bother them a lot. Um, I've had people, a, a simple fix is cutting out part of their I've heel of that. their shoe. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Jeremy Ardenoy did that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I remember that. And uh, Galen Rupp, he got surgery though, right? Galen Rupp did? I think he did. Yeah. yeah. The surgery so. for the most part is, is fairly straightforward, um, but it does require time off. Yeah. Um, it's kind of just like depending on if they do anything additional, which sometimes they'll do something to the Achilles okay. or they'll do something else. But if it's just a pure Haglund's deformity, they'll just shave it down and then put you in a boot for a little bit. And, and But both of these can come back, right? Like mm-hmm. you can get surgery to remove a bunion or the... Yeah, and it, and can, it, can, it can come back, yeah. Oh, man. That'd be like worst case scenario. Yeah. It's like a bad version of a chameleon. Like you get it cut off and then it comes back, but not in a good way. And yeah, yeah. <laughs> like, a limb. what happened with that <laughs> yeah so it's interesting because that to can, compare, can that technically to happen to but. any like any bone anywhere yeah in a sense like for example Schlatter's, if you've ever heard of that in kids that's uh like an anterior knee pain uh and you can feel on a kid's like if they go through a growth spurt um uh-huh. You can feel on their tibial, it's called your tibial tuberosity, but it's where your patellar tendon inserts. And it's because your patellar tendon is pulling and it's it's getting tighter because your bones are getting longer at a faster rate than the tendon can keep up. And that tendon will pull and you'll have like little sharp. I no have way. one because I had Oshkosh Slaughters growing oh, up. Wow. Yeah. Really? And it's like part of my bone feels sharper and more like prominent than another area. Doesn't It's not an issue, but oh. it's just like how the bone responds to a force. Man. Um, um, okay. I, we have to ask cause otherwise Thomas will get angry at us, mm-hmm. but he was running with Robbie and Jarrett a few weeks ago mm-hmm. and he fell mm-hmm. and he dislocated his shoulder oh. mm-hmm. and then Did you hear about this. No, he this like, wild time. he calls me and he's like, Oh, you got to come get me. I just dislocated my shoulder. And I'm like, Oh my God. So I'm like getting ready. And then I get to call 20 seconds later and he's like, I'm just going to keep running. So he goes and does his 20 miler that day with his dislocated shoulder. And he's like, he said it's hurt for a while. But anyway, so we've had a lot of people commenting saying he should have gone to PT. He should have had it in a sling. He Mm should have been doing all these things, which he did have a sling, but Mm -hmm. he like didn't really use it. Mm -hmm. So what, what are you supposed to do if you dislocate your shoulder? Well, my question would first be, did he relocate it himself? Like, did he put it back in place? It popped. Yeah. He said it was like up here and he just pushed on it and went back in. Back in. Okay. Um, well, that's good. (laughs) Step one. Um, yeah, typically, so you can have a shoulder subluxation or a shoulder dislocation. So subluxation means that it kind of shifted out of place. Okay. Uh, dislocation means the whole humeral head, uh, of his shoulder came out of the whole joint. So I don't know what, which happened. I don't either. I wasn't there. Oh, he said it was like popped out. He said it was like beside his, like up front. I don't know if that's the whole way out or not. Okay. You like a lot of times when you full, yeah when you fully dislocate it, it's it's pretty hard to put it back oh, in okay. yourself. Um, 
And oftentimes it's not like you just push it and it'll go. It's like you have to mm. turn the shoulder a certain way and oh, yank oh on gosh. it. Yeah, yeah, I don't think that happens. So, so he maybe, might have more so subluxed okay. it. That's good. And when you sublux something, it usually means you stretch the tendons less than if you were to dislocate it. Oh, okay. So it would be easier to go without rehab. Okay. Um, I probably still wouldn't recommend it because with the with the stretching of those ligaments and tendons, like you want to make sure that you do like a at least some rotator cuff strengthening because that's what's going to give you kind of the stability back to your shoulder. Yeah. Not that running requires that much shoulder stability though. So well, does it still come out? Because he said it sometimes would just like come back out. Yeah. But I think it, I think it's been fine for a while now. Mm -hmm. um, but so when he did buy the sling, then he talked to another friend that was like, if you're not using it, mm -hmm. then that actually makes it worse. Yeah. It can get, you can get frozen shoulder that way. Yeah. Uh huh. That so, sounds crazy. Yeah. Frozen shoulder it's called adhesive capsulitis and it means that the capsule it is, is adhering to itself and it gets stuck. And so then you can't like move the shoulder. Yeah. Um, it doesn't, does it's not a guarantee to happen at all, but it can happen if you immobilize your shoulder for, especially after a trauma. Cause you can have like post-traumatic adhesive yeah. capsulitis. Wait, so which one should you do then? You should mobilize. You should move your shoulder around okay. for sure. Um, but sometimes <laughs> keep it in a sling. So if you, <laughs> if you fully dislocated it, a lot of times they'll have you be in a sling for a brief amount of time. Okay. Um, or if say if you fractured something that's different because you have to protect the fracture yeah, site. Sure. So ligaments and tendons, those are typically not something you have to protect in the way that you have to protect a fracture. Okay. So the sling use is typically recommended less for a subluxation or dislocation if that's all that happened. Um, the problem is a lot of times people have like coinciding fractures. Sometimes that will, will if it's really traumatic. Okay. Um, but for the most part, generally speaking, mobility, like not keeping in a sling is a better, okay. better move. You just don't want to do anything like like push ups. Super fast and yeah. <laughs> Was he doing push ups? He's doing push ups. <laughs> okay. Um, well, they are like a closed packed. It's, All right. it's not, it's not terrible, especially if he just subluxed it, which it okay. sounds to me like he yeah. did. So the problem is though, it is like your ankle sprains. Things mm -hmm. like joint subluxations can become repetitive. Mm -hmm. Um, in the shoulder, particularly if he did tear his labrum, which he'd have no idea if he did that unless he got an MRI of it or saw someone who assessed his labrum, um, that can cause like recurrent shoulder instability. So meaning it'll just pop out mm -hmm. easier yeah. if he doesn't do the right strengthening things for it. Okay. I guess we'll see. Yeah. Yeah. yeah real gamble. Time will yeah. tell. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like I know his personality too. He's like, well, uh, yeah, whatever. That's yeah. pretty whatever accurate. That's also what I would do, by the way. So <laughs> I'm not judging. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay. There's another topic we did want to hit on. I know we're probably already almost to time, but oh, people don't care. They're listening. Um, <laughs> bring those questions yeah. on. Like post-operative, after you've gone through a surgery mm -hmm. or like a very traumatic, like coming back mm -hmm. to whatever sport, let's say running. Mm -hmm. What are like those best practices? Yeah, so every surgery will be different depending on what you had done. Um, most of the post-operative surgeries I see are ACL reconstructions, meniscal repairs. Um, I do see joint replacements, uh, but joint replacements, you don't actually, structurally there's nothing to protect because they had it all replaced. Um, so if you're trying to return to running one, you always have a protocol that you follow that's usually issued by your surgeon. And that's the reason you want to follow his or her specific protocol is that they may have done something that's not typical or have a different type of strategy, a different type of way of doing a surgery. Um, so they usually want you to follow their protocol, which I'm usually very mindful of. There's no reason yeah. for a PT to while out on their, on another surgeon's like protocol without their permission. Sure. Um, but you can, a lot of times you can progress faster than your protocol as long as you're hitting different benchmark criteria. And that's where it's it's hard to say generally speaking, but with ACLs in particular, one you have to know was the meniscus repaired with the ACL because that has weight bearing restrictions and then running will be introduced later typically for that reason. Um, but if not, you can typically run anywhere from four months out. Some people want you to wait six months. It kind of depends. Um, 
but you want to make sure there's a couple hallmark things of like making sure you have enough quad strength, enough hamstring strength, um, making sure that you can hop on one foot and control that because that's kind of what running is, is a consistent hop over and over again. Um, we use the Alter G, the treadmill that fills up with air when someone's coming back post-operatively because it allows you to be less hesitant yeah. doing something so high impact. Um, but yeah, it really depends on what type of surgery you had, but you have to have the understanding that it is not an overuse injury. It's like a totally different yeah. ball game. So it requires a lot more patience. Um, it's a one reason I encourage people not to rush into surgery if they don't really need it mm -hmm. because it will require a longer yeah. process. Have yeah, you, hard. what's a case where you've seen someone and they have an injury and it doesn't heal on your, has there ever been a case where you're like, you're never going to run again? Oh, geez. Oh boy. Because I think some people think when they get injured and they're dealing with injuries, they're like, it's in the back of their head that I'm never going to be able to run again. Mm -hmm. Is that ever the, the case? Honestly, pretty rarely. Yeah. Now, the, one thing that I do see a lot of at, at Sinai in particular is we see a lot of bone deformities and congenital deformities. Mm. So some of these patients don't have normal hip joints or they don't have normal knee joints. Mm. And for those patients, if they're looking to run, we have to be really careful with how much we recommend they run okay. because their anatomy is just not the same as somebody else's. Right. And those are people that I will say like, Hey, I'm in support of you running like up to a mile a couple times a week, but I really don't think your hip joint can tolerate a half marathon. Um, hmm. So those are the biggest patients that, that I tend to say, like you, you cannot be a super long distance runner. Okay. Gotcha. Um, most of your overuse injuries I think people do feel that way. Like they'll never run again. Right. But it's usually cause your scope is so narrowed to yeah. like the couple <laughs> yeah. weeks you're in that yeah. it's like a lot of my job is just talking people off the edge. For of sure. Like, I believe chill that. out. You're going to yeah. be fine. Like it's, it's, we're going to be good. Like yeah. we're, it's like, you might not run the cherry blossom 10 miler, <laughs> but we'll set you up with a race six weeks after that one yeah. and like work towards that. So there's, you know, there's certain traumatic things like septic joints or avascular necrosis or things like that are really uh, bad just to, to happen to the human body that are hard to recover from. Um, but that's got to be pretty rare, right? Yeah, those are much more rare. Okay. Um, even things like hip impingement, which I know people have asked questions about of like, why well, I have a cam lesion or I have a hip impingement. Like, am I never going to run again? And it's like, one, it's helpful to know like, what degree of hip impingement you have. Um, cause it'll give us a good idea as to like what you could tolerate. But for the most part, we see people running fine with hip impingement. They just have to be, they have to accept the fact that they will be someone who has to constantly work on a hip strength and hip mobility protocol. And if that's what, that's what it's going to take for them to run regularly and they have to be open to that. Yeah. And some people say, screw it. Like I'm just going to turn into a cyclist and some people say, yeah, that's fine. What I'm does that even that. mean? What's a hip impingement or a cam deformity? Those are in your actual hip joint. So impingement is a kind of an umbrella term. Cam, there's a cam lesion or there's a pincher lesion. It depends on, you can have a lesion in your acetabulum, which is like the cup part of your hip socket, or you can have a lesion on your femoral head, which mm -hmm. is like the, the part of your actual femur that circles around. And what can happen is if you have this impingement, it means that the femoral head is pinching somewhere in the hip joint itself. And it could be because the cup is misshapen or it could be because the head of the femur is oh, misshapen. Okay. And so you'll get a lot of pinching. You'll get a lot of like typically anterior hip soreness or like they call it a C sign where you reach around your hip and it kind of covers the front to the side of the hip that you get like dull oh, achiness. Okay. And it can, it can be quite chronic. Um, and it's typically symptomatic with running because you use your hip flexors so much when you run and those muscles are very much involved with stabilizing your hip and you can get like an overuse kind of combination of the hip flexor in addition to the joint being kind of chronically just misaligned because right. of a structural thing you have going on. Okay. Gotcha. Um, and then I'll, I was going to throw this out there since it w you had it highlighted and we didn't cover it, but all the moms want to know, 
How to strengthen <laughs> pelvic floor muscles. Oh boy. And when to see a PT. Yeah, this could be like Oh, is this a, a big whole, thing? This could be a whole podcast. Oh, really? Of pregnancy and running. Um, but I mean, we could save it for I, another time if you think. Yeah, yeah. I think my biggest like advice to to pregnant women is is you should see like a pelvic floor PT. Like you should even if you don't have symptoms, like it's such a great resource to have and it's so underutilized in the terms of like you see an OB every however many weeks and you have a you know, an ultrasound done however many like you you do all these things to kind of track the baby's health, but like your body is mm. like going through like the biggest yeah. change you could ask of it. True. And to know and to consult with a pelvic floor specialist that a lot of people like one of our best friends is pregnant and um, she's having twins and and her body has just changed. Like she's a tiny little lady at baseline and like she's holding two babies yeah. like it's nuts to me. And when we were telling her like, oh, you should see a pelvic floor specialist, she wasn't even sure what that meant. And mm-hmm. a lot of people don't. Right. Um, and it's like a pelvic floor specialist is a therapist who speci- specifically learns the anatomy of the pelvic floor for men and women um, and and what the changes are that occur with pregnancy and postpartum. And so when you are entering that phase of life, like consulting with one is one of the best things you can do. And you want to do it when you're pregnant and you want to do it after you're pregnant too. Even if your doctor doesn't recommend it, you should still like at least go and use the resource because it can really keep you from running into a lot of issues down the line. Okay, I have one final question that's going to bring us all the way back to the beginning of the tendonitis, and that is, you said, depending on where you are, like if you're getting ready to go run the Boston Marathon, maybe just ice it, take some Advil and run, or a leave or whatever, mm-hmm. and run it. If that's your decision, and you're like mentally like just want to make, like you can't do any worse damage to it, right? Like you go out and run a marathon is not going to do anything worse. I might get flack for this, but not really. <laughs> okay. Um, the, I think the big thing that people fear is like if I push mm-hmm. a, a tendinopathy or tendonitis, like my Achilles is going to rupture. And we don't really see that happen. Okay. Like you're going to rupture your Achilles by like playing basketball as a 48 year old guy who didn't do his <laughs> warm up. Like it's usually a fast like push off that you like all of the Achilles ruptures I have ever seen <laughs> for the most part have been older dudes who went out and played basketball with their kids and didn't warm up and they jumped or pushed off. Uh-huh. This, is actually, this is actually this is actually follow up question because I was I do play basketball with my kids and I was also thinking of starting to play pickup basketball mm. with some friends. Yeah. What are those what are those exercises to do? You just you have to be warmed up like you have to you should do calf raises before. Okay. You should do high skips. You should do like you should run a little before, do some side to side movements like um, but we don't see people rupture their Achilles by running on a tendonitis. Sure. It, yeah. The Achilles is a really strong tendon. It has to have the perfect combination of force and speed to happen. And running is a submaximal force at a at a reduced speed when you think of the what the tendon could be put under sure. in terms of a fast jump. Yeah. Something like pushing off skateboard could do it. Mm-hmm. Um pushing off a wall like we see it with parkour we see it with but pickle is pickleball in the same thing not really we don't but really see if you sprint up to the <laughs> to the kitchen when that kind of couldn't that possibly yeah do maybe it? like that i've seen people with like a quick like push off yeah do it but usually it's i have yet to see it in pickleball oh really say that. yeah but do you see a lot of other things with pickleball i've i actually had to write an article on pickleball and rehab uh-huh. uh and then turn into this whole other article. But um, I think with pickleball, we see a lot of hamstring issues and back issues because you're okay. hunched over so much and you do these kind of like awkward hunched movements. And that's what causes people to strain their hamstring or their back. It's usually muscular strains. It's not uh, tendon issues because it's not really like oh, really? continuous loading. It's it's more dynamic and it's usually like muscle strains of okay. the hamstring and back that we see the most of. are you getting really aggressive at pickleball no <laughs> yeah, i'm gonna do a pickleball podcast i'm personally not i did play uh, last weekend but with my wife but i'm not a pickleballer i guess uh, i yeah, yeah. Cool. If, I, if i'll play it every now and then but i'm not making did a you habit like tennis yeah i played tennis 
growing up and stuff. And so I, I just, do, I do love tennis. Tennis makes me tired. Mm. Like those fast <laughs> movements. And I'm like, just thinking about that with pickleball. And I'm like, no, I'm out. Pickleball is like diet tennis though. I feel like it's yeah, like ping pong and tennis put together. Okay. Maybe I could do that. Yeah. Rac- I think you could do it. Racquetball's fun too. Yeah. I haven't played that. In I've a long seen time. people do Achilles tears in racquetball yeah, too. I can see that. Cause yeah. that's a quick force production. Um, but to answer your question, running on, like you might, the, 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 most likely thing is you might prolong, like if your goal is to run Boston on Mm -hmm. Monday, you should, you should be willing to know that like, if you have another race planned in the next couple weeks after that, you might be kick yourself out of that. Yeah. So whenever I interview someone or I, or take their subjective, I'm like, what is like a goal, B goal, C goal? Like what kind of time frame are we working with? Because this will dictate how fast we push you. Sure. And, and that'll, be a big factor in how you rehab something. But for most people, if let's say Boston is the big goal, they're going to yeah. be taking downtime afterwards. So it's almost like, yeah, get through it, it yeah. do it. Yeah. Like it's the Boston marathon yeah. or it's whatever it is right. for you, whatever. like whatever your race yeah. is. Like, uh, it's, it's not like running on a stress fracture in your femur. Like sure. that is different, yeah. but a, a, a tendonitis or a tendinopathy is, is something you can, you can push. It's just, it might not be super comfortable. Cool. Yeah, I'm luckily not going through that. So <laughs> that's this great. was just a random question. I wasn't asking for what worked oh, for you. I was you? wondering that too. No. <laughs> I remember listening to you talk about it and you said you got like the thing that you put on your treadmill that the lever. Like, yeah, the lever. I used that when I was training for Houston uh-huh. um the beginning of last year. And, and that in, was an Achilles thing. Yeah. Like an Achilles tendon. Did that help? It did. Okay. And yeah, like I I ran the Houston and then I took time off and it healed itself. Okay. Okay. Um but I didn't know if that was the right thing to do. Yeah. Yeah. For those who don't know, a lever, the lever is like an anti-gravity type thing for, for, home, at home. for home yeah, treadmills. Yeah, you can put on your treadmill. Yeah. And it's way cheaper. Yeah. What's, what's, a, what's an anti-gravity oh, treadmill God. cost you? 20 I, grand? I I would say yeah, probably. Yeah. yeah. I don't fit those bills, but. <laughs> the lever's not cheap, but I think it's like $1,000. So it's like if you are yeah, investing in that, it's, you know. Yeah. yeah. it's Yeah. And if you're. Could save you. We have some people who come just to use the alter G for the most part. I believe part. it. So oh, really? Save you in those medical bills. Yeah. Wow. I I will say having the lever is like a really big comfort because it is just nice to know if you like, especially if you're coming back from an injury mm-hmm. or you're just you know you're getting back into things. It's mm-hmm. it's so ideal to just like gradually. Yeah, and get even into if it. you're doing a lot of PT clinics, don't have alter Gs. Like, yeah, it's not like in every rehab place you go is going to have one. So sure. having the lever at your disposal is. Yeah, a those places deal. in Omaha probably don't have those. Remember, remember I how? I feel like somebody commented <laughs> no, no. and said, "Like, actually, Omaha." There's a <laughs> there's a handful of people last episode when I mentioned Omaha that were like, "We have great PTs." Yeah, here. I was and like, I, "I listen." Robbie said that. I, just, I, I don't just, know anything about Omaha. I was just picking a random town in the middle of America off the top of my head. Evansville. All right, how about Evansville, Indiana? We'll Here go we with go. That. Here All we right. go. The haters Come are coming. Evansville. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> All right. Um, anyways, is there anything else we need to cover? I think we got through a lot of what we wanted. Yeah. yeah a lot of questions. Um, yeah, but I mean, these are fun. So I think yeah. we'll just keep doing these. Yeah. Well, I yeah. like doing this. Like, we'll Robbie be- will have a new injury soon. And oh, I'm sure. We'll sure. wait for that to creep on up. <laughs> yeah. Definitely. We can have an update from Thomas on his shoulder. Yeah. Like, did he have to get a labral surgery? <laughs> well, and Helen in our office, she has a stress fracture in oh, her foot. She? Okay. Mm-hmm. Okay. And so, yeah, we're having quite a time over here. We can have like but, a hotline. I'll just answer the phone yeah. and just like, I worked the COVID hotline for a Sinai hospital for a little while. Did you? Yeah. Like in the thick of COVID. Oof. Or you and just, now, what do you, just you do? Fashion. Talk people down? <laughs> yeah. That's pretty much, I was just fielding questions that's wild. and I was like, I honestly like COVID has been around for about two weeks, so I'm not sure I'm the best, but yeah. I was like signing people up for tests and stuff. This was before vaccines. So, oh wow. And you were limited to one test per household. Oh, now you can get tests like me. I wisely. forgot how crazy that time yeah. was. Yeah. yeah. Wild to think about. Yeah. So I would like, I'd sit with the same like headset on and, and I worked from home for like six weeks and Whoa. people would call in and I would just try my best to like, did they ever talk them down? Did they ever just want to talk, like get a, like just cause they were lonely or something? <laughs> I had I, seen I, a knew, human in two yeah. days. <laughs> I had a couple moms like I felt so bad for the moms oh, out there with their crazy kids at home and like one woman was like my kid is has a cough but like 
he has so much energy and like he's running around in the backyard <laughs> but like could I take him to the park and I was like is there anyone at the park she's like I don't know I was like maybe just like take him to a secluded field and just let him run That's she's like crazy okay. wow in hindsight that is yeah but no one knew it's wild yeah it was like well, you didn't know what kind of surfaces it traveled mm-hmm. on and people right. are like wiping People're down watching their fruit the groceries. And stuff yeah yeah, yeah. Yeah, and I, my <laughs> one guy was like, I'm pretty sure like my dog gave it to me. Why aren't no we studying way. dogs? Like, what are you like, doing with your I dog, dude? Know. Yeah, I was like, <laughs> he was like, I think my son gave it to my dog. My dog gave it to me, and I was like, uh, googling on the CDC like yeah. website, like what is the issue with dogs? <laughs> so yeah, that's fine. All that to say, a hotline would be fine. <laughs> we we got could, experience. I think we could set one up to the podcast board. Maybe we should do a call, listener call in episode at Ooh, some point. Yeah, we yeah. should do that. That'd be yeah. cool. That'd be okay. really cool. All right. And we got fa- tons of topics. Like, And yeah. fall, probably next time you'll be on, we'll be right in the middle of fall marathon training. Mm-hmm. Like yeah. In yeah. August or September or something. Yeah. So that'll be good. Series, yeah. All right, cool. Okay. Um, remind everyone where they can find you if they want to. Yes. Um, so I am on Instagram, uh, pace underscore doctor. Um, if you're looking for to come in for running therapy or a running assessment, um, that's at the Sinai Running Rehabilitation Center. Is that, is that right? Yeah. Um, and our number is 410-601-4353. And you could just ask to speak with Annie and I'll I'll take your message or or uh, call you back if, if I'm with a patient. But but yeah, the most direct way is through Instagram or through just calling the clinic. Okay. Um, oh, what's this happy hour I'm looking at? What is oh, this that's thing? for our course. So okay. again, not open to you guys. Sorry. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I keep thinking like random people are going to show up to that. Robbie's I going for the yeah. I mean, I, sure. I didn't do. read any of the details except happy hour, May 4th. <laughs> I done. designed that thing on Canva. I want you to know. You actually you did a good job. It's, you know, it's that not means bad. a lot coming from you guys. Yeah. Um, but yeah, for our course that we're doing on May 4th and 5th, uh, Falls Road is hosting our happy hour for our course oh, okay, cool. participants. So we usually, we've done it at Charm City Run when we've done the course at True Sports and usually have some beverages and some appetizers. We do a little brief run and then hang out and just talk. Nice. Yeah. So that's yeah, that's part of the course. Cinco de Mayo up. weekend. Yeah. So Ooh, we might make that a theme. You need to do that. Yep. Yeah. For sure. Talk with Pete. <laughs> Canva has some Cinco de Mayo designs. You can do that. Oh, good. Okay. <laughs> if you want to make any, just send them over. <laughs> All right, cool. Thank you so yeah. much for coming in again. Yeah, thanks, thanks for coming back. Of course. Fun. And yeah, we'll do it again. Yeah, I'm down. I'm down for that. See you soon. All right.